Hey, how you doing? It's Clayton here from howtodrawcomics.net and welcome to today's comic art demonstration. In this video, we are drawing up a beautiful female head portrait of a character from Kozor, Descent into Madness, which is the comic book that me and my brother Corey are working on. You can check that out via the link in the description below. Just so happens, we've got Corey Barton himself in the house. Yeah, dude, I'm pretty happy to be here. Happy to talk with you about this piece man i mean it's probably one of my favorite pieces you've done for Coes or so it's pretty damn exciting to have you here this is like the first drawing demo i've narrated with another person and of yeah, all those people man. it's you my bro Dude, it's great man i mean i've always got a lot of questions for how you do your whole process i mean mm -hmm. even just watching this video go by i'm like damn like what decisions are is is he making like why that jawline one yeah the neck you know true so what are you thinking about in this phase man are you trying to keep it loose are you trying to like what's what do you think when you're sketching it is pretty rough isn't it and i know that you've said actually it's quite neat and tidy for a sketch yeah, man. but uh to me when i look at this it's a lot neater on me man <laughs> <laughs> to me when i look at this i feel like nobody else is actually going to know what the hell is going on it's just a guide for me so that I know, you know, what all the, the fundamental necessary structural information is going to be there, you know, yeah. so that I can jump comfortably into the inking stage, which is kind of what I wanted to talk about today is just going straight from that rough sketch into the final inks, because that can be tricky if you don't have some polished pencils there to use as a 100% set in stone guide to follow. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, dude, I usually use this style just for comics mainly. I mean, I don't see how I'd get a comic done if I wasn't able to just jump into inks digitally. Yeah, so, man. But I mean, I guess one of the things I usually worry about the most is like how the shadows are going to go. Yeah. So how do you think about that when you're putting in shadows... Do you think about it in the sketch stage? Do you think about it in the ink stage? Well, you're actually somebody who I look at and I go, man, that guy knows how to place down shadows because I see your work and your style just has heavy rendering and lots of dramatic cinematic lighting weaved into its style by default. And I love that. I have always admired that about your work, actually. And it's only right now in my latest developments as i've been practicing year in and year out that i've actually become c quite comfortable and indeed have fun when i'm establishing the lighting conditions for the characters inside my illustrations yeah. and uh and it's very organic i just drop the shadows in once i've done the contouring so you know i get the outline of the drawing done first and then i move on to the shadows then i move on to the rendering yeah, thanks, man. Well, actually, that's one thing I've just noticed. Like, dude, sometimes I'll be pretty rough with my hard, like, dark shadows, and I'll I'll sort of knit it up in the uh, rendering phase. Mm. But I've noticed, like, when you drop in your shadows, um, it, you can't see it at the moment because it's more line weights. Mm. But you're pretty neat about it. Like, how do you find that approach? Is it better or worse? Man, it depends on the artwork that I'm doing. If it's more of a fantasy type artwork that has a lot of detail in it, you're talking about a lot of different textures. Um, oftentimes, yeah. it's on male characters as well because you know they just tend to have a lot more shadow uh, yeah, to define absolutely. to define their anatomy, to define their their costume elements and that kind of thing. With a lady character such as this, you don't want that necessarily. You don't want to be defining cheekbones and you know chiseled chins and that kind of thing because yeah, yeah. what does that do? Makes them look gaunt, <laughs> makes them look older. And the number one error you can make on drawing a female character well, too yeah. much detail and a lot of artists they run into that problem actually it's the the number one issue that they have when it comes to drawing women is they just they add even one single line to the face that shouldn't be there can collapse the whole piece into something that could have looked youthful a, a beautiful woman with with vitality and 
an energy to her and it just starts to age her and make her look gaunt, you know, make her look worn out. You don't want that. That's what detail is going to do to your ladies. And, yeah, you know, the more of that you add in, you've got to be careful with the amount of lines that you use to define your female characters with. Yeah, absolutely, man. And, you know, sometimes I can find that tricky because you don't want a full-on rendered guy and then, like, a very light-looking woman. But, I mean, sometimes in cases that can work where you can get the characters that contrast. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it depends on your particular style and the level of detail you tend to add in there because there's there's different approaches to rendering and there's about a billion tones that you could make with the various cross-hatching compositions that you could create uh, you know you've got everything from pure black shadow to you know super dark tones that you can create with the rendering you can lighten that up of course by pushing those hatches further apart, making them thinner, until eventually it becomes lighter and lighter and lighter, and you reach white, pure white. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to comic book art, especially modern-day comic book art, such as this, it's a little bit more stylized, well, really, you're only talking about four tones max. You've got pure black shadow, you've got a mid-tone that's created by the initial hatches, yes. and then you've got white. Now, if you want one more tone, which is a little bit darker than that mid-tone, you can add in the cross hatches, And it's great. That yeah. is good, again, if you've got a very detailed style like David Finch's style, for example, or Mark Silvestri, you'll often see them tend to use their cross hatches in that way to achieve those effects. But, uh, you know, in this case, I didn't add that much rendering, to be yeah, honest with you. man. I mean, dude, most of your detail probably the darkest parts of this face so far is the um the eyelashes the lips and like the horns i was actually gonna ask so, so you do a really good shape on the eyelashes like how do you think about that how exactly do you get that shape to look nice yeah sometimes that can be tricky it's you know, it's definitely a stylistic choice yeah for sure and it was derived most certainly from one or many of my influences that have helped to shape the the artists that I've become. So Mark Silvestri would definitely be a big one. Yeah, Michael absolutely. Turner would be a massive credit to the eyelashes that I do for my characters. And it's not like I'm copying them outright. Like, yes. what you're seeing here isn't the kind of eyelashes that Michael Turner or Mark Silvestri would do. Yeah, it's so, almost like you've developed your own style of them. Mm. I mean, I'm still trying to develop my own sort of style. Like, I have sometimes struggle with overdoing them. Like, mm. sometimes you want to make them look neater. But anyway, like, how, did, how exactly did you go about developing that, man? I use those influences as a jumping off point. So, once I practice how they do it a few times, then I start to add my own touches. And sometimes it can be physical. It can be a physical act that causes it to look in, in a certain way. And what I mean yes. by that is maybe I flick my wrist in a certain direction with a certain speed and it pulls the eyelash out slightly further. And oh, yeah. I look at that on the page and I go, oh, that looks great. Sometimes it's just this, this energy behind your arm and your stylus as you're working that causes the the finished result to look a particular way. Yeah, it's it's very it's a very strange way to put it, but honestly, you almost feel out your style to a certain extent. Like when I'm adding in those eyelashes, there really is some rhythm behind the lines that I'm laying down onto the page. And then I fill them in. And sometimes I don't always get it right. If I don't like the shape of those eyelashes, sometimes I might do them too thick. Sometimes I might do them too thin. I'll yeah, erase absolutely. and start again. And there have been times where I completely erase an eyelash and, and just redo it because I'm not happy with the way it looks. It can really significantly oh, yeah. change the look of your female characters. 
I completely understand that, man. I mean, I probably do the same thing over and over again. So I get exactly where you're coming from. Yeah, dude. So when you were starting out trying to get good, would you just like copy these artists, try to implement the style into this, your stuff? Yeah, I did. I started out c- carbon copying their work and I placed all of those studies into sketchbooks that every now and then I'll still get out just to look at for, uh, I don't know, it's, it's almost a therapeutic experience. You know, to look at where I began, how far I've come. And the reason that I started out copying them directly, actually replicating pieces that they had already done, is because I wanted to just get a feel for their style. I had it in my head that if I could imitate the hatches that they would lay down, the line work, heck, even the composition of their pieces, something would sink in. And I'd be able to take over that information, that experience into my own work. And I think that for sure, I mean, here I am sitting here right now today, being able to draw stuff like this and I'm happy with it. I'm satisfied with it. Yeah. So it must have worked. Yeah, it did. It's, it's worked pretty great for you, man. I mean, you've really developed your own sort of a unique style, I would say. Like when I look at it, like, I know it's Clayton Barton that drew it, right? Mm. Say for, like, a beginning artist or someone that is, like, learning and they're copying from, like, say, like, David Finch or Mark Silvestri, um, what if they are worrying about just becoming, like, a copy of Mark Silvestri or David Finch? Mm. And, like, how do they transform into really developing their own unique thing? Like, how do they transition from that period of just copying into actually developing Hmm. into where they're not developing into a bad style or actually developing into a good, unique style? Yeah, I think that's why it pays to have multiple influences. So it wasn't just Mark Silvestri. It wasn't just Michael Turner. It wasn't just David Finch. It was all of those artists that I looked up to, that I admired, and whose techniques I practiced. I jump between them. Sometimes I do an illustration that looked a little bit more like Jim Lee's work. Sometimes I do an illustration that looked a little bit more like Greg Capullo's work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that when you can take all of those artists' look, place it into a blender, and pull something new out of it, that's ultimately what your style is. You add a little bit of your own spice, a little bit of your own flavor, of course, And again, I think that comes through physical execution. It comes through the way you interpret it and the way you think about it. You know, it's it's mental, it's physical. And sometimes, you know, there's that mysterious place called the zone where you're just taken away by your work. You know, you're you're stuck in the process. You're submerged in it. And it you find that your illustrations end up taking on a life of their own after that. So I definitely think your brain is very good at working with information that you put into it. You yeah. can you can create amazing things with that information. You just gotta give it the ingredients and it'll take care of the rest. And that's that's what I believe is the best approach to this stuff. I don't think you can just set out to create your own style without having any input at all. Yeah, absolutely. And say like, you know, when you're just starting out, like what if you're intimidated by another artist like David Finch or probably you, man, like there's probably a few new artists watching this same video. Do you think that's harmful in a way or do you think they should be trying to encourage themselves or something? Do you think maybe they should be looking at simpler styles or trying to aim for you if they're trying to aim for you? Man, I think you've got to aim for the style that tickles your fancy the most that gets you excited that gets you pumped to draw and for me you know that was mark silvestri that was you know all the artists that i've already mentioned and i wanted to i love their artwork so i wanted to draw like them and i could have gone for a simpler style and there were certainly like anime artists that i really enjoyed back in the day 
uh, there were anime shows, you know, Dragon Ball Z that I, I loved yeah. and still love right now. But I think that you've you've got to make a choice ultimately. And and even at this point in my evolution as an artist, I'm looking at you know the, the beautiful art of Busema, uh, which you know from Sa- Conan Savage Sword. Isn't he a a painter or is he an ink artist? He he's a, a penciler, but he was working with an amazing inker whose name escapes me right now. And they just together they made some of the most incredible artwork. You know, Bernie Wrightson yeah, would be another in, incredible example of that next level that I would love to take my artwork to. But here's the thing: I am struggling a little bit with that because <laughs> there's also the the physical ramifications of taking on an art style which is as complex and as intricate as that. For example, last night I was working on a commission. You saw it. And I was rendering the hell out of it, probably in an unneeded fashion. And by the end of it, my arm was just aching. You know, my hand was throbbing. I was freaking out. I'm like, man, am I going to get repetitive strain injury again? Yeah, because that man. if that happens, that means I'm out of action for a month, maybe two months. Dude, it's very scary, man. I mean, I always worry. I'm like, if I get arthritis one day, well, you know, we watched the uh, that biker show, and he's got like the problems with his hands. And he can't ride his bike. I'm Sons like, of Anarchy, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, what if you couldn't draw? Yeah, you, know, you worry about injuries like that. You know, it's funny. I was actually thinking about that as well. The clay from Sons of Anarchy. How he yeah. needs the injections in his hands in order to be able to ride his bike. I was Absolutely. feeling like that. I was feeling <laughs> like I needed some kind of, I don't know, injection to loosen my hand up again. Yeah, man. But I actually wear a magnetic wristband to try to help the blood flow through my hand as I'm drawing. And it does help. But still, you do have to start to think about the long-term sustainability of your approach to comic book production. And I think about if I did get arthritis, as you mentioned, yeah, I would still want to draw. So I would hope that my style, whatever I had chosen and whatever I had pushed myself to work toward would allow me to still be able to execute it even with arthritis. So... And when I look at the different artworks that I've created, there are times when I've got a very complex and intricate style. There are other times where it's a little bit more simple and stylistic. And they both look great and both get good reactions. So it just comes down to ultimately what satisfies me the most balanced out with what's actually possible for me to keep on doing long term. Yeah, and dude, that brings me up to another point when because we're getting on to pretty much rendering out and cross hatching soon how do you keep your cross hatches from looking muddy because that's a big problem for me sometimes i'll over render where the lines aren't neat enough and it'll just look a bit muddy yeah I mean, and it happens to me it, it totally happens to me man i mean this piece isn't the best example for rendering because again it's a female character who's fairly stylized. Yeah. She's going to have a little bit of rendering on her clothing and maybe in her hair, but even that is going to be hatching, not really cross-hatching. So yeah, absolutely. M- muddiness isn't a problem that we're going to run into. But on a more complex piece, for example, I did the, a character sheet not long ago, about, about a few weeks ago, which had some very detailed characters on them. And, yes. and extremely intricate costume designs. With something like that, again, I think it's just a matter of being very careful about where you place the shadows. Because if I if I think about the rules that I adhere to when I'm working, yes. one of those rules might be the larger the shadow, the larger the hatching. Yes, Exactly. Okay, the more the more curved the form, the longer those hatches are going to be to create that softer transition. The harder the form, you know, for example, say that we're working with some kind of mech character. Like 
chrome sort of material. Well, not necessarily chrome, just a hard-edged yeah. form. Well, you're going to have very sudden transitions between that rendering from dark to light or from mid-tone to dark tone. You know what I mean? Yeah, And so exactly. because you get those hard edges, of course, that means that when you lay down that hatch in order to indicate that hard transition, it's going to be much shorter. It's going to be more sudden. And so thinking about those rules, that's what allows us to achieve a more accurate rendition of what it is we're trying to show our audience. Because that's all that this is about, is trying to create a believable idea on the page that other people understand. And those rules are there to help serve that purpose. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, man. And, you know, I can see bits of that working. Um, like, I really like how you've rendered out her lips in a way. Like, you didn't use a solid black to shade it. It's almost like just sort of, uh, small cross hatches. Mm -hmm. But it's, yeah, it's like a gradient almost. Yeah, it is. It's got a certain amount of shine to it. And you can see that where those hatches end, there's almost this this hard stop to them. Yeah. There's, there's a very definitive division between the highlight and then the darker tone of the lip that I've shaded. Yeah, and absolutely. that's what makes it look glossy, right? And over time, as you're developing your style, you start to figure out how to come up with these effects on your own. Yeah, sometimes absolutely. you stumble across them. Sometimes you see another artist using them. You decide to test it out. It works for you and you keep it. You don't always necessarily remember where it came from, but you keep it anyway because yeah. it works for you. And that's the key. Even with these tutorials and these drawing demonstrations that we might share with the, the audience watching now, they might observe what's happening on the screen and it may click for them it may not click for them and so you've got to take and leave what works for you as an artist because if you don't enjoy the process that you're executing when you're creating an illustration then it's not going to be a good time for you yeah you're absolutely. not going to have fun drawing comic books dude i've, I've heard a few times like a good point is like when you watch a tutorial video, you may only be looking for certain things at the time, but it's like, if you go back to the same video many years later, you'll probably hear different things because of what your focus is on. Um, another thing I notice, like with your female rendering on the neck, you can see it's almost like two lines put together to almost make it look like a shadow mm. in a way like how did you figure out that technique because that's a bit fancy yeah it suggests a recess within the anatomy there and it's a good question again i don't always remember where this stuff came from but you'll find that let's take for example the two lines that i've added in on the shoulder yeah. you could say that that's rendering it's helping to describe form. It's probably more of a surface texture detail than anything. But still, yeah. you can see how it almost, it makes that area that would otherwise just be a white void look solid. And the same thing is sort of happening with the neck. I'm suggesting some of the anatomy in a subtle way, which is important when it comes to female characters. Yeah, absolutely. You want to make sure that... Um, you're, you're keeping everything as soft and as subtle as you possibly can so as not to draw too much attention to it. If you started to notice those neck muscles in any significant way, I've done something wrong. Now, you're noticing them, of course, because of the fact that you're an artist yeah, who is studying this stuff, right? What you've done. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, that's another thing. It it just like sometimes you don't notice subtle things that an artist puts in, mm. but 
you know, enough of those little subtle things actually make up an effect in a way. Yeah, big time. Um, I like how you were trying to put in that sort of gradient shadow almost around the neck and then you've removed it. Like, why was that? Well, I removed it because it just wasn't working for me. It, it didn't quite look the way I wanted it to look. And I think that when you're able to discern what's working within your artwork and what's not working, that's a skill in and of itself. You want to make sure that as you develop your abilities, you're also developing your eye. Yes. Making sure that you're, you're understanding when something looks off so that you're able to catch the mistakes a lot easier because it's not uncommon to finish an artwork completely only to look back at it a few days later after the fact and see, oh, I could have fixed that. I could have fixed this. Yeah, absolutely, man. And yeah, I, dude, I love how you've rendered the hair as well, man. That looks... Yeah. It almost feels realistic in a way, but it's not. It's it's stylized. Mm. Um, you know what's interesting about the hair is for this piece, it was the first time that I had taken advantage of the stabilization function within manga studio and this is manga studio 5 at this point Absolutely. i have upgraded since to clip studio paint which is you know just as good pretty much the same application but they both have the stabilization function and that's basically yeah. a an effect that you apply to your pen or your pencil whatever it is you're using and it allows you to draw smoother lines because it steadies it for you so even if you have a wobbly hand you are able to draw out a, an elongated line that's, you know, curvaceous, straight, whatever you want through the hair, for example, of a character. And it's going to help you to do that more effectively. Because even if you're, you've got the steadiest hand in the world, you're still going to get some shake there. It might be a little tiny yeah, surface. Um, it's uh, just a, a natural yeah. sort of... You know, a ripple in a way. It is. Like, you've got a pulse flooding through your veins. Like, there's going to be some level of movement in your hand. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. And basically, the, the way I render hair is... It, well, it's very interesting. You'll notice that I work it up in stages. So, I define the overall shape. I figure out what the flow of the major clumps of hair are yes. going to be. And then I just keep on dividing it up more and more with those additional contours that I'm laying in. And as I start to see it take form, I get a better idea as to where the next set of lines need to be added in order to push its depth, push its volume, push its texture. So all of this stuff is a sculpting process. In the beginning, it starts out vague. Yeah, absolutely. You start to mess around with it a little bit. You have uh, you, you build it up in a progression and more and more it takes on the vision that you've got in your mind and sometimes it even exceeds that vision sometimes it turns out better than you could have ever imagined and it, it becomes something else entirely which is fantastic that's what you want as opposed to something that turns out way way worse than uh, than you thought it would yeah absolutely man i mean this looks great um Another thing I always worry about is when I flip the canvas and I'm like, my whole drawing looks out of whack. Like, it looks like it's always, like, slanted in a way. Yeah. Do you ever get that impression from your work? Sometimes, yeah. And I think the more that you flip your canvas back and forth, the easier you're able to avoid it. But here's the other thing. I believe that it also helps you to, over time be able to just draw your artwork with a good a, a decent symmetry by default because as you flip it back and forth you're starting to become more and more aware of what decisions you're making that are leading to an asymmetrical piece that doesn't quite look right that's distorted in some Absolutely. way and so i i think again it's just an experience thing you know you start to realize oh you know when i'm drawing the head from the left, it takes on this weird slant that, you know, maybe goes in this direction or that direction. And sometimes 
that's not for any other reason other than the curve of the movement of your hand as you're drawing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But do other, like, people see it that way? Like, when you flip an image, is that just only you looking at it look whacked? But when it's, like, when you see it, like, you've drawn it up on without a flip, is that the way everyone else sees it? Or are they all seeing it differently? That's a good question. This is going to get a little bit philosophical, but I think people have a tendency to just accept what they see without analyzing it too much. It's only when there is a, a conflicting perception of what they're seeing or an incongruency with what they're seeing that their ears perk up and their eyebrows raise and they go, wait a second, that doesn't look right. And what I mean by that is it's only that they notice there's something wrong when the image is flipped because now it looks weird to them. Yeah, absolutely. Right, because the first time they see it, they just accept it for what it is. It's like, oh, that's great. Right, so they wouldn't notice the slant. I don't think so. And the reason that I say that is because I've taken a look at other people's artwork, some of those artists that I admire, and I've gone ahead and I've flipped their artwork around and I've all of a sudden noticed all these mistakes within their work. But I didn't notice it the first time around. Yeah, it's very interesting, man. Yeah. Very interesting. It is very interesting. I mean, I've heard that's why a lot of manga comics, they don't like the pages to be flipped like that. Mm -hmm. Because that's when you'll notice it a lot more. Yeah, absolutely. So, that's always been an interesting thing. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, it's something that you've got to look out for. And you can see me now adding in these hatches. Uh, I'm not... I'm, not, I, I'm taking them out, I'm adding them in, I'm not sure exactly what is going to work and what's not going to work. So I trial test a lot of the decisions that I make before I actually settle upon them. Yeah, absolutely. And should you judge your own artwork too much? Is there such a thing as overjudging it? If you want to get better, but you don't want to break yourself down. Man, I think that you've got to judge yourself in a positive way. So, for example, last night when I was working on this commission, I realized I had over-rendered the characters on it. And that's a negative experience by default, a negative realization. But actually, there's a lot that I can learn from it and to take away from it. In fact, it could completely change and re-solidify the way in which I approach my comic book art from that moment onward, a realization that I might not have made had I not had that you know, negative experience. Yeah, absolutely. So I actually, I get a little bit down about it for like five minutes and then I move on. I just start to look for the positives. I go, oh, well, you know, next time I'll do it like this or I'll do it like that. It's like when you're playing a video game and the level kicks your ass, you don't just give up, right? <laughs> It I sometimes will, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you give up for a while, but then the game pulls you back. Yeah, and, absolutely. And you, you're thinking about it. You're dwelling on it for a while afterwards, thinking about, okay, how am I going to beat that damn boss? Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, you, you progress. You level up. And you get those experience points behind you. And it, in the end, makes you a better artist. Yeah, absolutely. And so what about those days where... You know, you're basically, you're low on motivation, but, you know, you've got, like, a commission, like a comic book or something you have to actually work on. Like, how do you actually just do that? And how do you make sure it's good and make sure you're still doing your best? Man, how do you get in the zone? That's a good question, man. Honestly, i got to tell you, I haven't yet quite figured it out. But uh, I just, I think there's a professional mindset and an amateur mindset that you can take on. And the amateur mindset says that I only work when I'm motivated to work or when I'm inspired to work. But all of those things are independable. They're, sorry, undependable. Yes. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. And so you've got to have discipline and dedication. And again, I think if you've got a certain amount of obsession with drawing and, and creating comic book illustrations then that's going to be what carries you through those tough days. 
because it's it's just who you are. It's what you do. You're a comic book artist, so you're going to draw some damn comic books today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that just about wraps up today's drawing demonstration. Yeah, it's been an absolute been pleasure. Very yeah. great. We I enjoyed do more this. Of these. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've I personally learned a lot. Really? So. <laughs> I'm glad you've learned a lot, man. Yeah, man. Well, I had a lot of fun. I think that this is uh, it was, was quite a cool video to do. It's good to have company on these drawing yeah, demos, dude. actually. We'll definitely do it again. I'm very interested to see what the viewers think about it as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let us know in the comments below. Give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you got some value out of this particular demonstration and conversation with the Barton Bros. Absolutely. Make sure you ring that bell for notifications too, because uh, you know YouTube doesn't count your subscribe if you don't do that for some reason. <laughs> it doesn't believe that you want to be subscribed here. Um, and yeah, as I said, let us know what you think in the comments below. Share it with your friends. They will thank you for it, uh, especially if they're fellow comic book Absolutely. artists like us. Yeah, it'll definitely help us Hell yeah. to get more out there. So. Absolutely. Oh, and if you'd like more comic art tips, tricks, and techniques, be sure to visit www.howtodrawcomics.net. Over on the site, we've got a bunch of drawing tutorials that are written, some video tutorials on the same subject matter. And then when you're ready to take your comic art skill set to the next level, I highly suggest you browse through our premium selection of courses by a range of different amazingly talented instructors including David Finch, uh, Trent um, Kanuga, uh, Robert Marzullo, Ed Foychuk, etc, etc. There's a bunch of them. Check them out. You'll enjoy them. Absolutely. And then we can't forget our new YouTube site or YouTube channel, Barton Bro Studios. Yeah. So, well, you know, let's, you know, there is the site, BartonBroStudios.com. Oh yeah, exactly. Uh, we've got the YouTube channel now as well, Barton Bro oh yeah. Studios. And yeah, dude, sometimes we'll, I, I personally like to do some full streams. Sometimes Quaid will show off his artwork mm -hmm. while he's streaming. So if you want to see more long form content like that, Hell yeah. jump over there. Absolutely. We're, we're building an empire here. Um, and of course, check out Ko's or Descent into Madness, yeah, absolutely. Our, our comic book. Which is what, where this chick is from. If you want to see more of her, some more amazing artwork by me and Clayton, just check out the comic. You'll be able to get it printed and sent to you. Hells yeah. All right. Till next time, keep on drawing, keep on creating, and we'll catch you in the next video. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.